Hello everyone, today we have an exciting Captain's Compass for you. In the prior editions of this sub-series, we've been discussing with data professionals what they do in their day-to-day -day lives so that we can get an insight into what data title actually means with the people who are actually doing the jobs. Uh, if you've missed any of the prior installments, uh, you can click above to go to the playlist and you can see all the prior installments and keep up to date with the ones that are coming out. In today's episode, we're going to talk with a data consultant to see what life is like as a consultant in the data world. Uh, it's much different than you know, working for a vendor like I do or just working in the field. So I think it's a really interesting episode. So without further ado, let's dive in. Sure. Uh, thanks, Stephen. My name is David Dumas and I work at a consultancy. I'm a data warehouse, uh, data engineer, primarily working with Snowflake right now. And so can you can you kind of talk about, um, you know, in your in your, you know, you're obviously in a consultancy now. Have you always worked in like consultant firms? Like how did like what is your data journey look like up to this point? Yeah. So about 15 years ago, I really worked, uh, started more into uh, data warehouse and um, concentrating really more in um, analytics um branching out from Oracle to SQL Server and Oracle and maybe some other transactional databases. And, but it was all basically on-premise, um, on-premise systems, right? You know, back before, back before we have the cloud. Um, and then more recently I've been working with um, analytical tools like Tableau and Snowflake um, to produce really reporting applications for customers. So. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it, it seems like, I mean, I've only been in the data space for like, you know, three or four years now. And it, it almost seems like it's weird to see a world without the cloud databases, without the snowflakes and the big queries and, and all those, but that time wasn't that long ago. And I mean, there's obviously still a lot of organizations that are still on, you know, on-prem systems. Um, so can you talk about kind of the advantages and disadvantages between like being on-prem versus like being in a cloud, like cloud database environment? Like, is there any reason is there any reason for an organization to stay on prem other than like cost and the time it takes to transition? Like, is there any other advantages other than those to stay on those on prem systems? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sort of operate on a, on a lens where we're dealing with large volume of data. And so I've gotten spoiled by snowflake, you know, in that I can analyze, you know, millions, hundred millions of rows and do analytics across that um, and not worry about performance. Um, so, you know, back in back when I was doing transactional systems, which I'm sure still exist, um, you know, as transactional applications. But but these days when companies need to make, you know, more strategic uh, decisions about about their data and analytics, um, I can't see a, there a reason to go back to that, for, you know, now that I'm using cloud databases, really. Right. Yeah. No. It's 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 interesting. My my very first role in the in the data space, I was a BI analyst at this lumber company in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I remember I was taking over the job from a consultant. Like we they, we were using a consultancy firm to like build this system, like build out our pipelines, build out our our Power BI instance, and he was going to give it over to me. And I remember he he trained me for like a month, and then he left, and I, he did his best, but I was I was lost. I had no idea what was going on. Like he could have spent a millennium with me. Still would have had still would have had an idea what was going on. So I guess whenever you're working in, as a consultant, are you working more long term on projects where you're staying on with businesses kind of for like an extended period of time, or are you more of like a setup and kind of hand off uh, approach? Yeah, so it depends on the projects. Um, of late, I'm working on long term, just on a long term engagement. Um, you know, assembling data from tools like, for example, like NetSuite data that's coming in for NetSuite or might be ADP for payroll or um, other systems that get integrated in and then I'll consolidate that data for reporting. So those, those tend to be longer engagements than a very sort of a point application that does a very you know, specific thing. So it's, and particularly with Snowflake, I think, um, and cloud databases, I think the engagements are definitely longer now. Um, and in particular, when when you when the data engineer ends up building, um, for example, using Tableau or, or other analytical applications, you know, building dashboards and reports, um, you tend to get into a longer 
longer engagement for sure. Yeah. So, you, you know, you mentioned that you're kind of leaning into doing a little bit of dashboard, dashboard work now, which is not something you were probably doing before. Like, how do you, I get, and you've kind of been almost through the full pipeline, it seems like, right? We've been kind of completely upstream with like extracting data and then all the way downstream now with actually building out those reports. Um, do you have a preference on where you've kind of set in, in that pipeline? Do you like kind of being more on the analytics side? Do you like more being on like the infrastructure side? Like what, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, so I, I have to say I'm a little bit spoiled. I do enjoy sort of seeing my work come to fruition. So being on the data engineering side, um, you know, cleansing the data and, and, you know, mapping it and essentially curating that data, but then getting the chance to actually see that on analytical dashboards, um, it just makes things a lot of, a lot of fun. I enjoy both, um, but, um, I would say about half, you know, 50-50 is, is, is really what it kind of I enjoy to do. And, and a lot of people don't get the out, get opportunity. A lot of people will just do the, the data pipelines and the transformation, and then handoffs will go to other people that, that kind of concentrate on the dashboards and the BI. Yeah, it's what, yeah, I did a little bit of data engineering work in my past time, I and mean, it's, it's a very thankless role, right, where it's like if you do your job well, no one really cares about what you're doing, but if you don't do your job well, everyone knows right like if that pipeline breaks everyone in the organization knows who knows who you are at that point so you almost want to be nameless as a data engineer right <laughs> yeah at times you have to make sure that uh that's you know you've done a lot of accuracy and verification and things that are not as exciting but nonetheless you know businesses are making decisions based on that data so it's really worth a lot of time in in, in doing that yeah, and, and and like I said, I, I have, I've never been a consultant, so like, I, what I might be, what I might, what I'm, what I'm about to say might not be true, but I know that you know, for us working at Shipyard, we almost get to be almost consultants, Angel and I, because we kind of pop into pop into organizations, help them build out use cases and things like that. And I think the hardest thing for us sometimes is trying to understand the context of the business like trying to understand business context to go with what they're asking us to build. And I I know that that has to be difficult for y'all as consultants, right? So like, is there part of, is there like a part of your, I know there's obviously the parts of your job where you're actually working with the data, but do y'all actually spend time like trying to understand business context and like, what does that process look like? Yeah. So particularly with a consultant role, you need to very quickly um, understand um, really what the business, what their pain points are. And as part of that process, you need to really understand um, really the business process that you're going to be involved in. And there's, you know, there's definitely upfront work before you, you're really going in and, and trying to build data pipelines. So the more of an understanding you have, the quicker you can, you can gain that understanding, the better, the more successful you're going to be for sure. And there's, there's definitely ramp up time um, in order to understand the business. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that's where that's, that's where a lot of things can go wrong is if you just try to like hire someone to be like, hey, we want to start doing this like right now, and it's like, well, I mean, I, we can start writing SQL code right now, like we can start writing Python or building dashboards, but they're probably not going to be what you want, right? And that's and that's so I think that ramp up time is something we don't. It's kind of like if you're preparing for a long run, you have to start running those short distances before you can start running the marathon, right? Yeah, ex exactly. And, and I've used over the years. Um, it's a business matrix where I'll actually sit with sponsors and just at a very high level map out what are their what are their target pain points? What are the you know for example things like KPIs that they want to see? Um, where are the areas that they're struggling? Maybe they're spending you know tens of hours every month on a particular process that they want to automate. So I'll I'll, I'll generally map that out in Excel so that at least the business has a good understanding before I actually start really architecting or coding of what things will be in the end state. And I think that that preliminary um, understanding is really is really important than to just start jumping in and modeling modeling tables and writing code. Yeah, for sure. No, that that's yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and so 
you know, I've, I've asked the same question to like everyone in this series about what your day-to-day life looks like in your position. And I think I'm excited for your answer because I think yours is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I know you mentioned that you do kind of work, you're working on more long-term projects now. So are you kind of working on a singular project a day? Like, are you switching between working between two or three projects in a day? So like, what does your day-to-day life look like as, as a consultant? Yeah, I'm generally served like in a, in a, in the role that I'm in now, I'm serving a finance team at a large company. And so there will be there will be groups within that company that will need um, reporting, right? So I will have to some of some of the projects could be two days, some of the projects could be two to three weeks, depending on the level of depth that I need to get. But they generally involve um, you know reporting, like I said, for the business, and then um, making sure reconciling data, making sure the data is correct before. You know, I build the dashboards, um, but there's always SQL involved. SQL seems to be the common thread across across all these projects. Um, there's always gaining an understanding of of what the report needs to look like, what it needs to show, can it be reused, um, things like that, and you know, working with tools that bring in data, like for example, Fivetran is is one that we rely on pretty heavily. Um, that that is really kind of streamlined data ingestion for I think a lot of companies, and then um, and then just using a lot of the tools in the Snowflake state space to to kind of curate the data, move it along in the transformation. So at the end of the day, it, it kind of always your success or, or failure sort of sort of is is based on your ability to code SQL really well. So uh, that's what I found has been a has been a big a bit of pause for the work that at least for the work that I do. Yeah. Now I feel like, I feel like if I had to come up with a name for this series based on after talking to everyone, it would almost be like SQL, like something about SQL being the most important thing across the, almost the whole, the whole space. Like I've talked to data engineers, analytics engineers, like BI analysts, like, you know, obviously you just said it as well. Like SQL is kind of that common thread that kind of unites all of us together. I mean, there's obviously the five trends and there's obviously the cloud databases, but like almost SQL is almost that like starting language that we all kind of have to be on to like start communicating with each other, which I think is really interesting. Cause I, I, they told me that in, they told me that whenever I graduated college, they were like, you know, Steven, if you don't take anything else out of this program, you need to learn SQL because that's, what's going to matter, you know? And I, it's just funny kind of watching that actually come to fruition. Yeah, that, and, and then what I found is, is just another big success or failure outcome is understanding, um, Business terminology, data catalog, common common source of truth, which gets you back to the right SQL to be able to use, um, and that's a challenge of companies because you can hear the same term, you know, on a report that's being used ten different ways, and the challenge is um, finding the source of truth in that data, and then keeping those terms consistent throughout your reporting. So that's so even though SQL is is sort of the common thread, it's just as important, I think, is getting a good data dictionary um, of terms, and so that everybody's sort of on the same page when they report. When they report. Yeah, funnily enough, it almost seems like you have a script in what we've talked about in this series so far because it's been SQL. And then, like, I asked them later on, what is like a competitive advantage that people can have going into the job field? And it's those, it's those like soft and communication skills, right? And like being able to figure out what those. The, like what those like terms and the way to communicate with each like each each like aspect of the business is like probably almost as important as SQL, right? Which is kind of what you just mentioned, um, which I think is really cool. I mean, that's you know whenever I whenever I wanted to do this series, I was kind of hoping that I would find I would find things like that that would kind of go across the full sphere. And I think that's really what it's all about in the data space. Is obviously you need some you need some skills to actually get your job done, but then you also need to know how to communicate. Um, especially in a role like yours, where I'm sure you're communicating with ultra technical people that know they they know how to code, they know Python, they know SQL, they they know all the infrastructure. But then you also have to talk to business people too. Um, yeah, and have you have you found that um, I'm, you're obviously a successful consultant, so you probably haven't found too many challenges in that. But uh, have you ever found any any challenges between like trying to communicate between those two parties, uh, like between the super the super technical and the business users? Yeah, you have to put a different hat on, I think, when you talk to technical users than when you than when you're talking to business users. Um, 
because technical users tend to be more very, very, very detail oriented. Um, and so you have to really know how to communicate the right details properly. Whereas the business, um, you're operating at, at more of a generalized level where, where they're talking about generalized terms and you need to take in the information and kind of digest it and then take that and distill it down and then and then work with the technical folks to you know to build something and then when you go back to the business folks you have to then communicate it at at the level that they're understanding in order to make sure that you're getting you're giving them what they want so it's all it's definitely a challenge absolutely yeah, it's like you have, you have to talk to the technical people to talk about how to do something, and then you almost have to sell what you're doing to the business people, right? Where it's almost it's almost a switch. You have to you, have, you really have to flip a switch, just like you said, which that's something I've noticed in my career too. Is like you got to be willing to flip. You got to be able to flip that switch between the two, or else you're going to lose one of them, which is never fun. Exactly, and you could be talking to you know technical people and business people in the same day, you know, two or three times a day. So it can be. Uh, it can be a challenge to, to, to wear those different hats. To... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I know you've mentioned. I know you've mentioned a few tools like throughout our, you know, you know, Five Trans, Snowflake, so on and so forth. So I won't dive into all the tools that y'all use. But are are at your at your at your organization? Do y'all kind of go to teams and say, "Hey, we have these suite of products that we can offer you," or are you more of like trying to fit based on what they have? Like, how do y'all make those decisions on like what's the best? Like, say they were trying to choose a BI tool. Are y'all always going to go with a Tableau, or do y'all will? Or do y'all kind of shop around to, to kind of see what tools to use? It depends how mature the environment is. So, for example, Tableau is typically a kind of a stalwart tool that a lot of companies, larger companies, have used. You know, as their, you know, their their sort of tried and true. Um, but we, but you will find um, other reporting uh, platforms like Sigma, for example, which will always be used that potentially can can build a sort of a quicker report for maybe a finance person that will satisfy their need just to do that specific that specific thing whereas tableau will be more of a richer in you know a richer tool to convey to a, a larger audience so it really depends on on the tool but in general what i found is to really look at the business need in terms of what, you know what they're going to need out of a certain um, tool and then find the tool and present two or three tools that may be the best in that space and then have them, you know, kind of decide based on budget, features, um, usability, things like that. Right. Yeah. I know that's something that's been interesting about my job here at Shipyard is that we have all of our integrations that we have and I have to like be comfortable enough in them to like give a demo usually. Like I don't have to know exactly what I'm doing, but I just got to, I got to be dangerous enough to be able to show something off. And but in your life you can't just be dangerous enough. Like you have to actually be able to build things out. So what is, you know, you mentioned that you might present three tools. So say that one of those tools that you were wanting to present you you weren't that comfortable in. So like how how do you go about learning like one of those new tools? Like what are there certain resources you always go to or you know what's that process look like? Yeah, gener so generally when there's a new tool, it has to go through a security um, analysis with the company. To make sure it may be SOC compliant and other things that, or that it's purely a SaaS tool, that it's maybe it's it's not an on-prem tool, it's purely a SaaS tool. So there, there are certain gates that you have to jump through. Once you get through security, um, then what I do is I typically will get a tool in for evaluation, and do the best that I can in conjunction with the company that's providing the tool to get up to speed and maybe demonstrate two or three areas that are really really important um, and you may have to do that um, for for a couple of tools to be able to really decide which one's best because you can end up getting a demo from a vendor and it looks fantastic with their data um, but until you actually get it in and, and sort of you know seeing what's underneath the hood in terms of functionality usability um, you know how how easy it is to learn you won't know the best tools kind of best tool to pick so usually being able to operate in a sandbox um, with a trial version of the tool helps a lot. And so kind of transitioning into, you know, kind of the, the kind of the reason that we decided to go on this in, into this series was we, we know that there's a lot of people out there looking for roles in the data field. 
whether they're trying to get into consulting, trying to work for a vendor, just trying to work for you know a, a business. Um, so if someone was trying to break into the consultancy field to do similar work to what you're doing, uh, I know we've kind of hit on them so far with like SQL and then obviously, you know, with you know some some like soft skills with communication. Uh, what other skills do you think would, are important for someone that's kind of applying for a role in this in this space? Yeah, certainly um, communication skills are, are very important, particularly in a consultancy role, because you're in front of a client. You want to make sure that, you know, you're 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 giving the best face forward that you can in front of a client. Um, and then core skills that may fit into whatever you're doing. In my case, that's that might be SQL. It might be data modeling. So those are two skills that are, are sort of universal as a data engineer, you know, SQL and data modeling. And then um, some, so some career paths will lean more into the Python related space. Um, some career paths will, will, will sort of, you know, which, is, which may lend, its, you know, may lend itself towards data science. And then some career paths may move you more into tool specific things like Snowflake and SQL and, you know, specific tools that are going to be used that are very common, you know, across clients like Snowflake, Tableau, etc. So it, so you do have to have good core skills in communication, data modeling, SQL, and then you may have to have specialized skills depending on the companies that you're going to be working, working with. I've not, I've had the luxury of not using Python, but realize it's a very important skill. It's just that what I do for companies generally doesn't involve the data science and the Python uh, granular, you know, granular skills. So it's it really depends. Yeah, and then something else that's interesting is, you know, I, I look at, you know, I'm active in kind of the DBT and local optimistic Slack channels. And, you know, I see people talking about, like, wanting to, like, kind of switch from working in the industry to being a consultant. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of – the way that I say it, there's two, like two paths in the consultant. Like you can kind of try to freelance as a consultant versus working for like an agency um, or, or I guess just a company, I guess might be the better way of putting it. Um, so would you have any, I know obviously you work for a, a company now, but do you have any, like is one way better than the other one? Is there like, it should, should someone not go down one of the two paths? Like do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, so I've worked both. I've worked as a freelance contractor in which a company will just, you know, bring me in um, for a specific project or staff hog. And then I've also worked for a consultancy. And there's sort of advantages and disadvantages of both. The advantage of working for a consultancy is primarily you really have a team behind you when there is something that you just ran into a wall. Okay. And you're trying to figure something out. You need some help. You might, you might, discuss that with a colleague on teams during the day about how they, how they approach this particular scenario. Um, in, as a freelancer, you have to deliver the silver bullet. So you generally don't have someone that you can ask those things, you know, to when you get into those sticky situation, you have to really, you know, learn it on your own very quickly. Um, and the, um, so there's really kind of advantages and disadvantages of, of both. In terms of working freelance as a contractor, you can really pick and choose your projects. So if you see a project with a particular technology that you know or, or that you're learning, and it's in an area in a field of business that you want to learn more, um, they can both be, let's say, a six month or a year. You know, I don't look for engagements that are anything less than you know six months a year. So you, you know, as a freelance consultant, you have more flexibility in the projects you choose because when one is done, you'll either get extended or if the project is over, you can move and then kind of pick another one. In a consultancy, there's less ability to do that. So you have more support, but there's less ability to pick, sort of pick the projects that you're really excited about, if that makes sense. No, yeah, that's super interesting. That's, that's, a, that's a good way of putting about, that's a good way of putting it too, is that you do get to have more flexibility if you're working on your own. But I imagine I kind of equate it back to when I used to be a tutor when I was in college, where it was like I got, you know, I had more flexibility and could pick who I wanted to tutor when I was not working for a tutoring company. But the thing that was hard was actually going out and finding the clients at that point. Um, and I imagine that's got to be a big advantage for working for a consultancy is you don't 
you don't really have to go market yourself at that point, right? You can just kind of take what they give you, which can be good or bad depending on what the situation looks like, right? Can be good or bad. It also depends on how strong they are in a particular tech. Um, so if you're in a consultancy that is very strong with Snowflake, for example, um, that you're probably going to be working in, in, let's say you love working in Snowflake, you're probably going to be able to get projects back to back. Um, whereas if you work consulting, it may not be strong in Snowflake, but they have um, a great project that you're on. When that project ends, if the sales pipeline is not there to put you into another one, then you're in a little bit of a dilemma at that point. So, whereas as a freelancer, you can, as long as you've, you know, you've done a good job, you've got good referrals, you, you can find these projects. Um, you know, that could be a great way too. So there's really, you really get, like I said, there's kind of advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of both. If you're in a larger consultancy, um, there's less worry about the pipeline of projects that are coming through. So, um, so it really kind of depends on that as well. Yeah. So whenever you were kind of working independently, was there a place that you were going to kind of find these next roles as you were finishing up a project? Like I, I know they post some of them in Slack, but is there, I was LinkedIn, like, is there a place that people should go look if they're looking to kind of do that, that, that work? Yeah. LinkedIn has been really good for me for that, for that kind of a situation. Um, LinkedIn. And then in the, in the past I've used indeed also. I found that um, with LinkedIn and Indeed, you you can find people that are direct hire with the company rather than using a recruiting firm. Many of them are direct with the company that, I'll, that that will contact me or that I will find on Indeed, for example. So sure, yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess LinkedIn is the place to be, and for all job type situations, I guess they've kind of taken over the market a little bit on that, right? Yeah, and they tend to be a little bit more dependable than a lot of emails that, that flood in from, from various places that are not really, um, you just don't, you just need to vet those, right? So kind of kind of closing us out here, so finishing us up. So the, the last question I've asked everyone in the series is, you know, say that you were trying to hire a, a junior consultant to join your consultancy and like work with you, um, you know, assuming you know, assuming everyone has the SQL skills, everyone, you know, has kind of those like tech skills, what would be something that someone could kind of show you in an interview that would kind of put them, like say 10 people applied and we're talking to you, what would be the one thing that could kind of get that person above the other nine people in that interview process? What would be something that would kind of make the light bulb go off for you? I would say someone that is definitely a positive person. That's a, that's a big deal. That can come across in an inter inter interview. Um, someone that's enthusiastic about what they do and someone that is that you have a good feeling that they would be easy to work with in a consultancy. It's important to be that you and your colleagues are, are working well together, that you're you're good, you're good teamwork, you're good teammates. Um, so you have to get the, the sense that someone is going to be um, if someone it, it, is easier to work with. You'll get that sense on an interview, then that's going to, that's going to stand out. So I'd say positive enthusiasm and, um, you know, easy, you know, works with, works with other, others. Well, <laughs> would be a good way to. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's been a common, you know, that's been a common theme throughout that last question with the answers I've gotten is that it, it really just comes down to, can you put yourself out to the interview as someone that the, uh, the team would want to work with? Right. And I think that's even more important in the consultant space because, you know, like, you know, I get along with my team here at Shipyard. But if I was a consultant, I would be working with a whole nother set of teams in like six months to a year, just like you said. Right. Where it's like you ha you have to be able to kind of work well with a bunch of different people because it's always going to change. Right. It's always going to change. And in your during your you know, during your time on a project, you're going to eventually, you're going to need something from several people that are going to be on the team at one point or another. And they're going to need something from you. And the more than you can project yourself as being helpful, um, it just goes a long way. Even if you're not as technically proficient, if someone knows that you're honest and you're helpful, that you may, you know, you may, you know, they know that you're going to take the time to find out how get, to get something done. Whereas someone that might be extremely technical, proficient, very hard to work with, um, you know, might might not might not work out as well. 
it might might be a you know tenuous situation to get through things on a daily basis sometimes. Yeah, I remember I remember my like very first like actual role in the data field. I remember they emailed me back whenever they, they accepted me for the job and they were like, Steven, we know that you don't know how to do the job, but we think you can learn. And I was like, once I read the first sentence, I was like, Well, I'm not getting this job. But then read the second one and was pretty pleased, obviously. So yeah, no, I, I, I can actually I can stand here and definitely back up what you're saying.